good day to you children and welcome to today's class today we would be doing the national income and the relegated or related aggregates towards national income so today we are going to do national income and related aggregates kindly be ready with your note copy and your pen and you will take down notes as and when you feel it is important the first term that we come to is economic territory economic territory now what is economic territory now economic territory is the geographical territory which is administered it is a geographical territory which is administered by a government it is administered by a government within where within where persons goods and capital circulate freely so what do we call an economic territory we call a geographical territory which is administered by a government where by all the people all persons all goods and capital they circulate freely it is termed in economics as economic territory Now the second term which you must know and the difference between is of domestic territory domestic territory we just talked about economic territory economic territory is the geographical territory and it is administered by the government where people persons goods and capital circulate freely a domestic territory of a country is a wider term is wider term than the political boundaries of a country political boundaries of a country it includes besides political boundaries the territorial waters of a country as well as its aeroplanes and ships operated by a resident operated by a resident of a concerned country of a concerned country across the different parts of the world across the different parts of the world and its embassies and its embassies fishing vessels oil and natural gas regions fishing vessels oil and natural gas regions operated by the residents of a country operated by the residents of a country on the international waters 
So a domestic territory, I will repeat again, of a country is a wider term than the political boundaries of a country. Why is it a broader term? Because it includes, besides the political boundaries, it also includes the territorial waters of the country, as well as its aeroplanes and ships, which are operated by a resident of a concerned country across the different parts of the world and its embassies. Now, fishing vessels, oil and natural gas regions, which is operated by the residents of the country on the international waters are also included in the domestic territories. Now add on to this, foreign embassies, foreign embassies located in India are not treated as a part of the economic territory of India, but as a part of the economic territory, but as a part of the economic territory of that country. Similarly, India's embassies, similarly, India's embassies in other countries, India's embassies in other countries are a part of the economic territory of India, even though they are situated in a foreign country. So one thing which you must understand here, children, is that any foreign embassy, any foreign country's embassy, which is located in India, these embassies will not be treated as a part of the economic territory of India, but rather it would be treated as the part of an economic territory of that particular country. So if England has its embassies in India, that embassy of India, which is in India, belongs to England. It is a part of the economic territory of that country. Similarly, the US, they may have an embassy in India. Their embassy in India is a part of their economic territory of that particular country. Likewise, similarly, India's embassies in other countries, either in the UK, France, USA, we have our embassies all over the countries, all over different countries. They are a part of the economic territory of India and they will be considered a part of the economic territory of India, even though they are situated in these foreign countries. But they will be treated as a part of the economic territory of India, even if they are situated in the foreign countries. So this is a big difference in economic territory and domestic territory. Economic territory, again, I'll repeat, is only a geographical territory, which is administered by the government, wherein people, that is persons, goods and capital, they circulate freely. But the domestic territory is a much wider term than the political boundaries of the country, because it includes, besides political boundaries, all the territorial waters of the country, as well as all the aeroplanes and ships which are operated by the resident of a concerned country across 
the different parts of the world and also its embassies. So fishing, vessels, oil and natural gas regions, which is operated by residents of a country on the international waters are included in the domestic territories. And then I said, foreign embassies which are located in India, they are not treated as a part of the economic territory of India, but as a part of the economic territory of that country. And likewise, similarly, India's, India's embassies, which are in other countries, different other countries, they are a part of the economic territory of India, even though they are situated in the foreign country or in foreign countries. So this is a big difference between domestic territory and economic territory. Now we move on to the next term, which is normal residence. Who do we call normal residence? The resident of a country, you can note down, the residence of a country ordinarily includes <clears throat> individuals, business units, business units, government and their agencies whose center of economic interest lies in the economic territory of the country in which he lives. So understand this point. The residents of a country ordinarily would include individuals, business units, government and their agencies whose center of economic interest lies in the economic territory of a country in which he lives. <clears throat> so that is the definition of a normal resident. We now talk about a citizen and a resident. Who is a citizen and who is a resident? Now, citizens and residents are two different terms. They are two different terms. Citizenship is basically a legal concept based on the place of birth of a person or some legal provisions allowing a person to become a citizen. On the other hand, residentship is basically an economic concept based on the basic economic 
activities performed by persons so understand this term also well children citizenship or citizen and a resident they are both two different terms when citizenship is a basically a legal concept whereby anyone who is born in that particular country he automatically gets citizenship so citizenship is basically a legal concept based on the place of the birth of the person this is one criteria where he could be a citizen of the country or there are some legal provisions which allow a person to become a citizen there are some legal provisions every countries have their own legal provisions which allow a person to become a citizen of that country now when we talk on the other hand of residentship residentship is only basically an economic concept which is based on the basic economic activities which are performed by persons so this is a big difference in citizen and a resident now we come to the next term which is net factor income from abroad net factor income from abroad which is abbreviated as n f i a the abbreviation is n f i a net factor income from abroad what is net factor income from abroad you may note down it is the difference it is the difference between factor income earned from abroad by normal residents of a country and the factor income earned by non residents in brackets you may write foreigners from that country so if you have to put it down in a formula we would say nfia equals income from abroad minus income to abroad so if you put it in a formula n f i a equals income from abroad minus income to abroad so the difference between these two whatever income we get from abroad and whatever income we are paying abroad the difference is termed as the net factor income from abroad and it is earned from abroad by the normal residents of a country and the factor income earned by the non residents which are the foreigners from that country this was the net factor income from abroad next next is the industrial classification 
industrial classification how do we classify the industries okay <clears throat> now in general practice all the production units of the economic territory they can be classified into broadly three groups all production units of the economic territory can be classified broadly into three broad groups which are those groups first we call primary sector second is the secondary sector and the third is the tertiary sector so three sectors are primary sector secondary sector and the tertiary sector now what is primary sector you can make a note down it is a source primary sector is a source of basic raw materials like land water sub soil assets sub soil assets etc for example growing crops catching fish animal husbandry forestry extracting minerals extracting minerals etc all these come under the primary sector it is a source of basic raw materials it is a source for the basic raw materials like examples i said growing crops catching fish animal husbandry forestry extracting minerals etc all these come under the primary sector next is the secondary sector <clears throat> now the secondary sector includes the production units production units which convert the raw materials into finished goods so the production units which convert raw materials into finished goods come under the secondary sector for example factories construction water supply etc all come under the secondary sector so basically it includes production units what does a production unit do do they normally they convert the raw materials into finished goods so that is the production process and all production process or all production units they come under the secondary sector and the third sector is the tertiary sector tertiary sector includes the production units which are engaged in providing which are engaged in providing 
or producing services. So all production units which are engaged in producing or providing services come under the tertiary sector. For example, transport, trade, education, hotels, restaurants, etc. These are units producing services. Transport, what does transport do? It's providing a service of moving goods and people from place to place, trade, education, hotels, restaurants, all these production units which are engaged in producing services would be termed as tertiary sector. So basically, all production units of an economic territory can be classified into broadly three categories. I'm repeating once more. First one being the primary sector, the second one being the secondary sector, and the third being the tertiary sector. A primary sector is basically a source of basic raw materials like land, water, subsoils, assets, etc. And I'd given you examples like rowing crops, which is agriculture, catching fish, animal husbandry, forestry, extracting minerals, all these, these are basic, as they are a source of basic raw materials and they come under the primary sector. The secondary sector, on the other hand, includes production units which convert these raw materials into finished goods. So all production units which convert the raw materials into finished goods come under the secondary sector. And examples I had given you were factories, constructions, water supplies, etc. And the third sector, which is the tertiary sector, it includes the production units which are engaged in producing or providing services. Providing services. And the examples I had given are transport, trade, education, hotels, restaurants, etc. So industrially, industrial classification is done broadly on three bases or three broad groups, primary, secondary, and the tertiary sector. We will stop here today, children, and continue with some more important and related aggregates of national income. Till then, all of you have a nice day and all of you keep safe. Have a nice day.